I was slow in joining with those who recommended the introduction of ground forces in South Vietnam, but it became perfectly clear something had to be done. General Maxwell Taylor, a four-star general and chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff under President John F. Kennedy, reflects on his reluctance and eventual conviction about the Vietnam War. In the mid-1960s, the United States is facing some hard choices in regards to the situation in Vietnam. Forces from the People's Army of North Vietnam seek to unify the country under communist rule, while the U.S. military has provided South Vietnam with military advisors, equipment, vehicles, and limited troop support. The question still remains, will the United States enter into a full-scale war with North Vietnam? With the United States Cavalry's new designations and capabilities, many are of the mind that the U.S. might hold an advantage over the North Vietnamese. The 1st Cavalry Division, Air Mobile, also called the 1st Air Cavalry Division, is organized in 1965. By using helicopters, the unit is now capable of using the vehicles for a variety of battlefield applications, such as large-scale troop movements, cargo lifts, medevacs, and aerial rocket and machine gun artillery. Ideally, Air Cavalry units lifted the burden on infantry units, who would have had to navigate the harsh jungle terrain in Vietnam on foot. But will the Cavalry's new capabilities be sufficient to secure victory in Vietnam? If you went to the CIA and said, how is the situation in South Vietnam? I think they would say it's worse. You see it in the desertion rate. You see it in the morale. You see it in the difficulty to recruit people. You see it in the gradual loss of population control. Many of us in private would say that things are not good. They've gotten worse. The 1st Air Cavalry Division makes its first flights under its newest designation during the Vietnam War. But in 1951, the United States military first uses helicopters for airlift and medevac operations during the Korean War. On September 13, 1951, a battalion of United States Marines are tasked with clearing enemy combatants from the area surrounding an extinct volcano, referred to by the Marines as the Punch Bowl. During Operation Windmill No. 1, the Marines utilized seven HRS-1 helicopters to deliver over 18,000 pounds of supplies and evacuate over 70 seriously wounded soldiers. The HRS-1 helicopters used by the Marines during Operation Windmill are a version of the H-19 Chickasaw line of helicopters especially built for the Marines. Beginning in 1951 in Korea, the H-19 undergoes live service tests on the battlefield. Operating under the 6th Transportation Company, the Chickasaw, as an unarmed transport helicopter, was put to the test in a variety of missions, from medical evacuations, to tactical control, to frontline cargo support. Five years later, in 1956, the British Royal Marines 4-5 Commando Battalion executed the first combat helicopter insertion with air assault. During an amphibious landing as a part of Operation Musketeer during the Suez Crisis, 10 Westland Whirlwind Mark IIs delivered 23 tons of equipment and 650 Marines. As early as 1961, 
the United States Army was sending CH-2 transport helicopters to the South Vietnamese troops. Operation Chopper begins on December 23, 1961. Initially, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam successfully utilized the helicopters, but soon the Viet Cong developed strong counter-helicopter attack strategies. And by January, 13 of 15 have been hit by enemy fire and four have been shot down completely. Even after April of 1962, when the United States begins sending Marine helicopter squadrons to aid the ARVN forces, Viet Cong fighters prove tenacious. And during 1964's Operation Sure Wind, 17 out of 21 helicopters are hit, and three of them are shot down. Back in the United States, the U.S. House of Representatives Minority Leader, Gerald Ford, gives an address to the National Press Club in which he let communist rulers and the American people know that the U.S. is working with and for the people of South Vietnam and we will not bow to any communist forces. The communist leaders in Moscow, Peking, and Hanoi must fully understand that the United States considers the freedom of South Vietnam vital to our interests. And they must know that we are not bluffing in our determination to defend those interests. Many elected officials like Ford espouse a clear goal of victory over communist forces through American ingenuity and the physical and technological strength of its military. In reality, the problem of how to win a war in Vietnam especially on an unfamiliar battlefield that is mostly harsh jungle terrain, raises a host of doubts in the United States military's true capabilities. At Fort Benning, Georgia, in February of 1963, the United States Army begins to experiment with combining light infantry with helicopter support. The 11th Air Assault Division's training exercises result in some disagreement about the tactical success of the unit. But even at the caution of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara pushes the unit forward under the counterinsurgency doctrine recently established by the Pentagon. As a result, the 11th Air Assault Division is merged with the 2nd Infantry Division and redesignated the 1st Air Cavalry Division. On November 14, 1965, Lieutenant Colonel Harold G. Moore leads one unit of the 1st Air Cavalry into the first large-scale helicopter assault, not only of the Vietnam War, but in U.S. military history. The 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry, carries with them a tradition of excellence and leadership, but its history is also a burden of bad omens. General George Custer himself led the 7th Cavalry into battle in June of 1876 at the Battle of Little Bighorn. Would the 1st Battalion emerge as the first successful Air Cavalry landing and assault mission? Or would they be doomed to repeat history? Army Specialist Jack P. Smith, who would later go on to work as an Emmy-winning news correspondent, recalled the Battle of Iadrong Valley in a 2003 speech given to fellow veterans of the battle. It is November 1965, the Yadrang Valley. The nearest town, Pleiku, a remote Vietnamese province capital, and west of town, beyond the stilted long huts of the mountain yards, flat scrub jungle cover the hills by the Cambodian border. A smuggler's haven, and now the infiltration route for the first North Vietnamese regulars to invade South Vietnam. American regular infantry, the first sent to Vietnam as the war escalates, have come to this border country to hunt the People's Army of Vietnam. They are the men of the 1st Air Cab, the first Army Infantry Division to ride into war in helicopters. The leading unit is Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore's 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry Regiment. Driving their choppers into a landing zone designated X-Ray, a few miles from the Cambodian border, on the 14th of November, 1965, they land on top of a North Vietnamese Army base, 
A ferocious battle ensues that lasts three whole days. Hal Moore's battalion several times comes within inches of being overrun. In the end, reinforced to brigade strength, the U.S. troops destroy the better part of a North Vietnamese division at X-Ray. 79 Americans are killed, 121 wounded, a total of 200 U.S. casualties, the highest toll of the war till then. But there are roughly 2,000 North Vietnamese casualties. I came in on the last day of the battle. I remember the NVA bodies were piled so thick around the foxholes you could walk on them for 100 feet in some places. The American GIs were the same color as the dirt and all had that thousand yard stare of those newly initiated to combat. The next day, after a restless night, my battalion, 27th, walked away from X-Ray toward another clearing called LZ Albany. Around lunchtime, we were jumped by a North Vietnamese formation, like us, about 500 strong. Fighting was hand to hand. I was lying so close to a North Vietnamese machine gunner but I simply stuck out my rifle and blew off his head. It was, I think, the only time during the war that a U.S. battalion was ever overrun. The U.S. casualties for this fourth day of battle, 155 killed, 121 wounded. More dead than wounded. The North Vietnamese suffered a couple of hundred casualties. The fight at LZ Albany was largely overlooked as an aberration. Poor leadership green troops. In this first encounter between their main force regulars, the two sides focused instead on X-ray. Interestingly, both drew the same conclusion, that each could win using the tactics of attrition. Two days and nights of intense battle, the 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry, digs in at location X-ray and manages to repel their North Vietnamese and Viet Cong attackers. One day after the Battle of Viet Drang, however, the 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry, is unable to escape an attack from the North Vietnamese near location Albany. This attack remains the most successful ambush of United States forces throughout the Vietnam War. While the outcome of that ambush is clear, the Battle of Viet Drang sees both sides claiming victory. The North Vietnamese wildly overestimates United States losses at 1,500 to 1,700, when the number was in fact just over 200. And the United States reported over 1,000 North Vietnamese killed, while the number is closer to 600. The question of victory remains unanswered, but the battle still stands as the first successful air assault by U.S. cavalry, and indeed, the first proper battle between the North Vietnamese and the United States Army. Ia Drang can even be seen as a kind of trial by fire for the use of tactics by both sides in the Vietnam War. The North Vietnamese learn that engaging the Americans swiftly and at close range gives them an advantage, while the United States Army now had a successful air assault under their belt, meeting their goals on the battlefield through air mobility, artillery fire, and close air support. Commanding officer for the 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry, Harold Hal Moore, who receives the Distinguished Service Cross for his unwavering courage and leadership, by example, during the action at location X-ray, presents the challenges faced by the Air Cavalry in his After Action Report. After Action Report, Ia Drang Valley Operation 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry, 14 through 16, November 1965. Commanding Officer, 3rd Brigade, 1st Cavalry Division, Air Mobile. Due to last minute positioning of the artillery pieces caused by air movement delays, the preparatory fires did not begin until 10, 17 hours. I was in the lead aircraft and had a good view of these fires. They were precisely where required and beautifully timed with the landing of lead elements of the assault company. Fires were concentrated principally around the landing zone, in the trees and high grass, and on a finger and in a draw leading down from the high ground northwest of X-Ray. The aerial artillery 
came in on the heels of the tube artillery fires and worked over the area for 30 seconds, expending half their loads, then went on into a nearby air orbit on call. The lift battalion gunships took up the fires and were immediately ahead of the UH-1Ds. As we came in for the assault landing, all door gunners fired into the trees and high grass. We landed and ran from the landing zone into the trees, firing our M-16s at likely enemy positions. On the ground, we received no enemy fire and made no contact upon landing. The terrain was flat and consisted of scrub trees up to 100 feet high, thick elephant grass varying in height from one foot to five feet, and anthills throughout the area, up to eight feet high, with thick brush and elephant grass on and around them. Along the western edge of the LZ, the trees and grass were especially thick and extended off into the jungle on the foothills of the mountain. At approximately 11.20 hours, one of the recon squads took a prisoner. I immediately took my S2 and the Vietnamese, Mr. Nick, and went to the location and questioned him. He was unarmed, dressed in dirty khaki shirt and trousers with a serial number on one of the shirt epaulets and carried an empty canteen. He stated that he had eaten only bananas for five days and that there were three battalions on the mountain above us who wanted very much to kill Americans but had been unable to find them. He stated that he was in the North Vietnamese Army. Around 12.45 hours, lead elements of Company B began to engage in a firefight of moderate intensity. Shortly afterwards, at approximately 13.30 hours, Commanding Officer Company B reported that he was being attacked heavily by at least two companies of enemy and that his right platoon was in danger of being surrounded and cut off from the rest of the company by a numerically superior force. The firefight became intense. Also, a few rounds of 60 and 81 millimeter mortar fire began falling in the LZ and on B Company. B Company also received some rocket fire. By 1740 hours, I decided that it was necessary to pull A and B companies, under cover of heavy supporting fires, back to the fringe of the landing zone and set up a tight defensive perimeter for the night. We were still in good communications with the surrounded platoon and it was ringed with close-in artillery defensive fire. My intentions were to conduct another coordinated attack during the night or early the next morning to reach it or to get them out during the night by infiltration. Joseph Galloway, a journalist who served four tours in Vietnam and is the only civilian decorated with the Bronze Star Medal for valor during that war, remarks later that if nothing else, Ia Drang was the battle that convinced Ho Chi Minh that the United States could win. As the Air Cavalry made revolutionary use of helicopters and air support during the Vietnam War, the technology ultimately proves inefficient to win against the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong. In this memo to President Johnson sent shortly after the Battle of Ia Drang from U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, says that the successful tactics employed by the Air Cav only seem to inspire enemy forces to step up their tactics and abilities and relentlessly pursue their goal of victory over the Americans. The dramatic recent changes in the situation are on the military side. They are the increased infiltration from the North and the increased willingness of the Communist forces to stand and fight, even in large-scale engagements. The Yadrang River campaign of early November is an example. Communist casualties and desertions can be expected to go up if my recommendations for increased U.S., South Vietnamese, and third-party forces are accepted. Nevertheless, the enemy can be expected to enlarge his present strength of 110 battalion equivalents to more than 150 battalion equivalents by the end of calendar 1966 when hopefully his losses can be made to equal his input. Some United States cavalrymen in the Vietnam War carry on the traditions of cavalry warfare from over 100 years prior. The United States Regiment of Dragoons was first organized on March 2, 1833, 
When the second regiment of dragoons was raised three years later, the original regiment becomes the first regiment of dragoons, a nickname that the first cavalry regiment still uses to this present day. The first regiment of dragoons serves from initial frontier duty throughout the Civil War through World War II. In 1951, the first cavalry regiment is created, essentially a reactivation of the first regiment of dragoons. In 1967, the 1st Squadron, 1st Cavalry, is deployed to Vietnam. The unit initially consists of three armored cavalry troops and one air cavalry troop, D Troop, which does not deploy until the following year. 1st Cavalry Regiment serves alongside the American Division, as well as the 101st Airborne in such locales as Chu Lai, Da Nang, and Tom Ki. D Troop the Air Cavalry Troop will remain on active combat duty throughout the last four years of the Vietnam War. While tanks and armored cavalry are utilized in Vietnam, it is ultimately the Air Cavalry tactics that mature during that conflict. As the war in Vietnam ends with the withdrawal of United States and other Allied forces, the United States Cavalry now possesses new knowledge, tactics, and capabilities for future use. In Vietnam, regiments such as the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment consisted of a headquarters troop, three cavalry troops, an aviation troop consisting of UH-1 transports, OH-6 Cayuse Scouts, OH-58 Kiowa Scout gunships, and AH-1 Cobra gunships. Rounding out the regiment are a tank company and a 150mm self-propelled howitzer battery. The ground troops are equipped with M48 Patton tanks and M113 armored cavalry assault vehicles. It is the mission of the tank companies to close in on the enemy with firepower once the cavalry reconnaissance troops have found and held the enemy combatants. The tanks were then to outmaneuver and destroy the enemy with shock tactics. As the war continues, in 1969, the United States began to equip most cavalry units with the upgraded M551 Sheridan and the M3 Bradley Cavalry fighting vehicles, the latter of which are used in hunter-killer missions where cavalry scouts in the Bradley vehicles, hunters, will seek out enemy positions, drive the enemy into a kill zone where the armored units or killers await in Patton and Sheridan tanks. Today, the 1st Brigade Combat Team, 1st Cavalry Division, is nicknamed the Iron Horse and is comprised of, among others, units from the 7th, 5th, 8th, and 12th Cavalry. The Iron Horses they use now have been in development since the 1st Combat Team was constituted in August 1917. Since World War I, tanks evolved with ever-changing technology. By 1980, the U.S. military is looking to replace its M60 Patton tanks, and they find what they're looking for in the M1 Abrams tank. Developed from 1972 through 1979, the third-generation main battle tank is named for General Creighton Abrams, commander of the U.S. military forces in Vietnam and former Army Chief of Staff. Crewed by a team of four men, a commander, a driver, a gunner, and a loader, the M1A1 tank boasts a 120mm smoothbore gun with 40 rounds, a 50 caliber M2HB heavy machine gun with 900 rounds, and two 7.62mm M240 machine guns with 10,400 rounds. The Abrams M1A1 weighs in at 63 short tons and is reinforced with Burlington Composite Armor, armor composed of top secret materials that withstand high explosive anti-tank rounds and other shaped charges. Often partnered with the Abrams on the battlefield is the M3 Bradley Cavalry Fighting Vehicle. Initially designed to support the M113 armored personnel carrier, the Bradley has ended up replacing them altogether. The reconnaissance vehicle is armored with steel and aluminum and is crewed by three men, but can seat up to five. Its main armaments 
or a 25 millimeter M242 chain gun with 1500 rounds, dual tow anti-tank missile launcher with 12 rounds, and a 7.62 M240C machine gun. In the 1991 Persian Gulf War, Bradley's and their powerful 25 millimeter cannon and tow anti-tank missile combination destroys more enemy tanks than the M1 Abrams. The Persian Gulf War began with an extensive air campaign on January 1991. Coalition forces from 34 countries rally together to oppose the aggression on the part of Iraq and its president, Saddam Hussein. In retaliation for Hussein's invasion of a neighboring country and vast bastion of oil, Kuwait, the coalition forces dropped over 88,000 tons of bombs with the goal to destroy Iraq's air force and anti-aircraft capabilities. The Center for Military History describes the initial ground maneuvers by coalition forces, including United States mechanized and armored cavalry units. On 24 February, when ground operations started in earnest, coalition forces were poised along a line that stretched from the Persian Gulf westward 300 miles into the desert. The 18th Airborne Corps, under Lieutenant General Gary E. Luck, held the left, or western, flank, and consisted of the 82nd Airborne Division, the 101st Airborne Division, Air Assault, the 24th Infantry Division, Mechanized, the French 6th Light Armored Division, the 3rd Armored Cavalry, and the 12th and 18th Aviation Brigades. The 7th Corps, under Lieutenant General Frederick M. Franks, Jr., was deployed to the right of the 18th Airborne Corps and consisted of the 1st Infantry Division, Mechanized, the 1st Cavalry Division, Armored, the 1st and 3rd Armored Divisions, the British 1st Armored Division, the 2nd Armored Cavalry, and the 11th Aviation Brigade. Between them, these two corps covered about two-thirds of the line occupied by the huge multinational force. After 38 days of continuous air attacks on targets in Iraq and Kuwait, President George H.W. Bush directed Central Command to proceed with the ground offensive. General Schwarzkopf unleashed all-out attacks against Iraqi forces very early on 24 February at three points along the Allied line. In the far west, the French 6th Light Armored and the 101st Airborne Divisions started the massive western envelopment with a ground assault to secure the Allied left flank and an air assault to establish forward support bases deep in Iraqi territory. In the approximate center of the Allied line, along the Wadi al-Batin, Major General John H. Talelli Jr.'s 1st Cavalry Division attacked north into a concentration of Iraqi divisions, whose commanders remained convinced that the coalition would use that and several other wadis, or ravines, as avenues of attack. In the east, two Marine divisions, with the Army's Tiger Brigade, and coalition forces under Saudi command attacked north into Kuwait. Faced with major attacks from three widely separated points, the Iraqi command had to begin its ground defense of Kuwait and the homeland by dispersing its combat power and logistical capability. As the M1 Abrams tanks moved into battle along with British Challenger 1 and Kuwaiti M84AB tanks to their side, it quickly becomes clear that Iraq's tank technology cannot compete with coalition forces. For the first time, GPS is used by coalition forces for navigation, turning the battle into one of maneuver rather than a battle of encounter. The GPS allowed coalition fighters to move without need for maps, fixed landmarks, or even roads, and superior air support help coalition forces drive Iraqi forces out of Kuwait. In 2003, when the United States military returned to Iraq for Operation Iraqi Freedom, the M1A1 Abrams tanks and Bradley CFVs were still rolling onto the battlefield. 
In addition to superior mechanized reconnaissance vehicles and tanks, the United States Air Mobile Cavalry today uses a variety of attack helicopters, as the Center for Military History relates. The experience of Vietnam showed that the existing attack helicopter, the AH-1 Cobra, was vulnerable even to light anti-aircraft fire and lacked the agility to fly close to the ground for long periods of time. The AH-56A Cheyenne helicopter, canceled in 1969, had been intended to correct those deficiencies. The new attack helicopter program, announced in August 1972, drew from the combat experience of the Cobra and the developmental experience of the Cheyenne to specify an aircraft that could absorb battle damage and had the power for rapid movement and heavy loads. The helicopter would have to be able to fly the nap of the earth and maneuver with great agility to succeed in a new anti-tank mission on a high-intensity battlefield. The first prototypes of the AH-64A Apache attack helicopter flew in September 1975, and in December 1976, the Army selected the Hughes YAM-64 for production. Sophisticated night vision and target sensing devices allowed the pilot to fly the nap of the Earth even at night. The aircraft's main weapon was the Hellfire, helicopter launched fire and forget missile, 16 of which could be carried in four launchers. In place of the anti-tank missile, the Apache could carry 76 70 mm 2.75 inch Hydra 70 folding fin rockets. It could also mount a combination of eight Hellfire missiles and 38 rockets. In the nose, the aircraft mounted a Hughes 30 mm single barrel chain gun. Full scale production began in 1982 and the Army received the first aircraft in December 1983. As of the end of 1990, the McDonnell Douglas Helicopter Company, which purchased Hughes in 1984, had delivered 629 Apaches, which equipped 19 active attack helicopter battalions. When production was completed, the Apaches were intended to equip 26 regular Army, two reserve, and 12 National Guard battalions, a total of 807 aircraft. Faster and quieter than the UH-1, the UH-60A Black Hawk helicopter can lift an entire infantry squad or a 105mm howitzer with ammunition. Widely in use by Air Cav and the 101st Airborne during Operation Desert Storm, suffering minimal casualties, Although the 101st suffered no combat deaths during the four-day ground war, the attached 2nd Battalion, 229th Aviation, was less fortunate. Five soldiers were killed when hostile fire brought down their Black Hawk helicopter, which was on a combat search and rescue mission to recover an Air Force pilot. Iraqi forces captured three members of the Black Hawk crew and released them soon after the war flown by two pilots with two more chiefs or gunners, the Black Hawk could carry up to 11 troops or six stretchers for medevac use. Arming the helicopter are two 7.62 millimeter M240 machine guns with either two more 7.62 millimeter M134 minions or two 50 caliber GAU-19 Gatling guns. Different variants of the Black Hawk are also armed with Hydra 70mm rockets, AGM-114 Hellfire laser-guided missiles, or M230 gun pods of varying calibers. Chief Warrant Officer Michael Fife recalls his time as part of Task Force 118 in the Gulf War. Fife describes being a part of a crew on board a Kiowa Warrior Reconnaissance Helicopter. Tonight the moon did not rise in the North Persian Gulf. No stars could be seen through the dense layer of fog and dust. The horizon was barely visible through Anvis 6 goggles of the flight leader. The air crews of the U.S. Army Aviation Detachment aboard the Mobile Sea Base had never seen such a condition of total darkness and 
meteorological obscuration. The only lights visible were from the gas oil separators of offshore rigs. The nearest land was nearly 100 miles to the west. As would become the pattern of operations in future months, the flight crews conducted a flight briefing at precisely 18.30. Scheduled takeoff would be after midnight. After pre-flight, the team relaxed in the six-man room below the hangar and flight deck. Without warning, the oral warning sounded. General quarters, general quarters, all hands man your battle stations. Iranian gunboats inbound. Quickly the air crews put on second chance vests and 9mm pistols and ran down the hall and up the stairwell to the flight deck. As the pilots and crewmen ascended the steps, loud cannon shots could be heard in the distance at nearly one per second. Little time was lost finding seats and responsibilities as this had been already briefed. As the pilots found their aircraft and positions, the flight team was already pushing the 275 rockets into place and arming the 50 caliber machine gun. The aircraft were cranked and running within minutes. The launch order had already been given prior to crank. As flight leads radios were brought online, internal combo checks were completed. Left seaters immediately typed navigational alignment data into onboard computers to bring the system online and powered the thermal imaging site. Right seaters rolled their throttles to full operating RPM and turned on all weapon systems. Flight lead initiated the call to the FFG that would control the launch and vector to target. A ceasefire order was given aboard the FFG and the warrior flight departed the deck 50 feet above the smooth waters of the northern Persian Gulf. Immediately after leaving the deck, the two AH-58D aircraft joined in formation and proceeded on their initial vector to the northeast. They were ordered to arm and fire at any hostile vessel in the target area. Only seconds into the flight, it was apparent how bad the visibility and flight conditions were. The Army aviators aboard the aircraft realized that, for perhaps the first time in their careers, they would really earn their pay. Any branch of the United States military will have customs and traditions unique to that particular branch. The United States Cavalry is no exception. In the 1st 7th Cavalry, the Order of the Spur is a tradition that dates back to the days when cavalry rode and fought on horseback. Know ye that, with carbine and colt in hand, having followed the guide on to the very frontier of the free world, and having demonstrated the skill, fitness, dash and cunning of a United States cavalry trooper, defeating his enemy in the sands of northern Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom, and is hereby entered into the rolls of the Order of the Spur, and is hereby awarded the Combat Spurs. Given this, the 10th day of October, 2001. The Order of the Spur is to recognize individual qualifications for those in a cavalry unit. The privilege of being awarded spurs in the U.S. Cavalry comes with hard work. Two years must be served in the cavalry, and you must be certified by your branch or military occupational specialty qualification school. A spur ride is led by spur qualified non-commissioned officers and is supervised by the squadron command sergeant major. Officers generally conduct their own spur ride along similar lines. Traditionally, it starts at the break of day with group PT or a PT test. Individuals and their equipment are inspected and a thorough hazing of candidates begins. During the course of the day, candidates are subjected to different stations that test their initiative, military expertise, and stamina. As night approaches, the candidates are assembled and provided with instructions. From there, the candidates must negotiate a general route from station to station where, again, their skills and tenacity are tested. Their route is designed to take them over a 25-mile course in the dead of night. During the course of the night, and usually into the morning, candidates negotiate the course and, eventually, arrive at the finish line. All the while, points are issued, and cavalry soldiers are graded on marksmanship, physical fitness, and a written cavalry thesis 
with bibliography. Perhaps one of the most iconic cavalry hallmarks is the Stetson hat. In the mid-1960s, Lieutenant Colonel John Stockton began the tradition of modern cavalrymen sporting Stetsons, modeled after the cavalry hats worn on the frontier by the likes of General George Custer and many other cavalry troopers of the late 19th century. Stockton's goal was to instill in cavalrymen a new esprit de corps, and it worked. Air Cav troopers wore the hat in Vietnam, and the private purchase item is a point of pride, even today. In 2011, the United States Army issued a statement that all Army headgear would be replaced with the Stetson hat, just in time for April Fool's Day. Washington, April 1st, 2011. In a fingertip to the brim nod to its American frontier history, the Army is changing hats again, returning to the tumultuous days of the horse cavalry in the Wild West and adopting a dark blue Stetson as the official headgear for the current force of 1.1 million soldiers. We figure the Stetson will be popular with the troops, said Sergeant Major Bob S. Stone, Army Uniform Board Headgear Task Force President. It's been a while since we have changed the headgear, so it's time. Plus, a Stetson is functional and downright American. But reminiscent of the controversial switch from the garrison cap to the Black Beret, the Army faces opposition from one community deeply opposed to losing its special identity with the Stetson, the Armor Branch. Why in the heck are they doing to us what they did to the Snake Eaters, asked one officer familiar with the board's deliberations. If you ain't Cav, you ain't ought to be wearing a Cav hat. That just ain't right. First appearing in print in a cavalry journal from 1923, Fiddler's Green is a poem that purports to have been passed on from various sources within the cavalry, dating back to the 1800s. The poem envisions an afterlife for the cavalrymen that is just as hard as the life they live in combat, serving their country. Halfway down the trail to hell, in a shady meadow green, are the souls of all dead troopers camped near a good old-time canteen. And this eternal resting place is known as Fiddler's Green. Marching past, straight through to hell, the infantry are seen, accompanied by the engineers, artillery, and marines. But none but the shades of cavalrymen dismount at Fiddler's Green. On July 28, 1866, the Seventh Cavalry was born. One of the most storied regiments of the cavalry, their nickname, Gary Owen, comes from an old Irish drinking song that they had adopted as a march tune. We are the pride of the army and a regiment of great renown. Our names on the pages of history from 66 on down. If you think we stop or falter while into the fray we're going, just watch the step with our heads erect when our band plays Gary Owen. watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.